Yeah, sorry I wasn't able to be there today. Um, I'm at a professional learning opportunity at Central Office, um, but I will be back on Friday. Uh, today you're going to be watching a video with Kathleen Richard, who is our uh, Southern Star community partner. She's going to be talking about contracts, what she does at Southern Star, uh, everything that kind of is enveloped into her job in context and connection to our project with originalism versus living document uh, interpretation of these founding documents and contracts. So uh, it's really important that you listen. Uh, sorry she couldn't Skype in or uh, FaceTime with us during uh, your class period because I was out and the technology is so complicated. So we recorded it. You're going to watch that. Um, please pay attention to it. Write down any questions that you have and I can get those to her later. Um, but most important, after we watch the video, you guys are going to be working on Benchmark 2. Okay, if you have not turned in Benchmark 1, you need to make sure you turn in Benchmark 1. Benchmark 2, uh, there are, uh, it's a one-page paper in which you're writing three paragraphs. If you go in and read the instructions, it's pretty straightforward. The first paragraph is going to be your argument, uh, looking at living document versus originalism. This is originalism. This is where you're using your pathos, your passion. You're just telling your uh, argument, how you feel about it. Um, and, and just presenting your ideas through just your opinion, okay, on if we should be originalist or living document. The second paragraph is going to be uh, concerning your evidence or the Supreme Court case, and we're going to call that precedence, okay? Precedence is when you have a case that's already been decided, and that's showing us how we should look at a law or an amendment or something like that, okay? So you're going to take from benchmark one your precedent, and you're going to talk about your case, okay? You're going to talk about all the information from the case, and you're going to present that in that paragraph, okay? That's going to be the who, what, when, where. Look at the information on uh, Echo in benchmark two to get the instructions on that. The last paragraph is going to be your conclusion. This is where you're going to tie it all together and you're going to talk about do I think, uh, or this is how the Supreme Court case ties into uh, the, um, my opinion on originalism versus living document. Okay, this is where you're going to tie all that together and you're going to talk about um, kind of concluding it. Okay, you're going to kind of uh, wrap it together. This is really what you're going to say in your presentation. Now, we're not going to do that on Friday. We're going to have a little more time to work on this on Friday, uh, but a lot of you all might not be here because of the canned food drive and coming in the morning. So we're going to do the presentation on Monday, but Benchmark 2 has to be completed by Monday. Okay, If you're here tomorrow, we can talk about it, work on it, and continue to work on it. If not, we'll see you Monday, ready to go. You all enjoy the video. There is one spot where you have to kind of... Uh, uh, just wait. We reset the technology or the video, so you have to be patient with that. Um, otherwise, make sure it's loud enough and you can hear it. Thanks so much. See you on Friday. Pause this real quick. Okay. Um, good morning, uh, Kathleen Richard. I went to UK for undergrad. I got a degree in English. And then I went to U of L for law school. Um, I work at Southern Star Central Gas Pipeline. For those of you, and I think I've spoken with some of you. Maybe I don't. Hey, um, I think I've spoken with some of you. Maybe uh, when you guys were freshmen or sophomores. But for those of you who don't know what Southern Star is, it's a natural gas transmission company, or basically the UPS of natural gas. Um, we've got the producers out in the, the Midwest or the West that, that produce the, the oil and natural gas is a byproduct of oil and we take that, that natural gas and we um, transport it down to LDCs and LDC is a local distribution company. Uh, so here in Owensboro it's Atmos would be the local distribution company. So we take the gas from thousands of miles. Uh, you know, let's say it's in Colorado and we'll transport it down all the way to Missouri. I, I negotiate a lot of different types of contracts. Um, I do contracts with third party vendors um, or contractors, for instance, right now I'm working on a $10 million contract for modular compression uh, for one of our compressors, compression stations. Uh, so that, that takes me not only understanding what a compression station does, 
it, it takes me working closely with engineering, with supply chain, working with all of these different groups to make sure that all of their necessary uh, rights are represented in the contract. Because um, we don't want a term in there that would negatively impact any of them so that it would hinder us actually getting the compression in place. So that's, that's one of the types of contracts that I work on. Uh, another type of contract would be the commercial contract. So when we set up a new contract with the customer, we have to follow uh, the guidelines of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. So we have to make sure we're in compliance with FERC on that piece and we're working with customers, we're working with our internal clients. Um, and the other type of contracts that I, there, there are plenty of others, but another type of contract that I, I work closely with and help negotiate is our, our collective bargaining agreement which is the contract that the company has between Southern Star, the company, and the union that represents some of our employees. I won't, I won't go into the details of, of that, but that's probably the contract that I'll focus most on today. Um, so keeping contract law in mind, um, why, why does contract law and the different things that we're required to comply with and follow, and, and what does it mean we have an executed contract, and what does it mean to amend the contract once we have one in place, and how does that all tie to the Constitution? And really, you know, with, with contract law, we've got the third party interest, and we have Southern Star's interest. And we work for weeks and weeks and weeks, both parties work for weeks, sometimes months, sometimes years, to get a contract in place. And once we have a contract in place, we have to be able to depend on that legal document anytime there's a dispute, anytime there's an issue, anytime we're looking for guidance, what do we do in this situation? We go to that contract. That contract should, in theory, contemplate every type of situation we're gonna run into. So there are some instances where we didn't contemplate a certain issue happening or occurring, or um, maybe what we negotiated two years ago really doesn't apply anymore. Uh, so what we'll do is both parties agree to amend. Now, sometimes that's, that's easier said than done. Um, well, and, and what it means to amend a contract is, you know, we said that we needed, we needed 10 widgets. Like, well, now we need, we need 20 widgets. So we'll amend the contract to require the other party to supply us with 20 widgets. Now the other party would be like, no, we agreed on 10 widgets, we can't supply you with the other 10, you're gonna have to go somewhere else for that. And I'm like, well, you're the only supplier in town. So sometimes they want to amend, um, other times they don't. With our collective bargaining agreement with the union, we agree to negotiate the contract every, depending, it's not always set in stone, but typically every three to five years. And in between those three to five years where we're negotiating the terms and conditions, um, we can go in and amend it, but that's very, very difficult. Typically, in those situations when you want to amend, it's the language says, um, our language doesn't actually say this, but as an example, the, the language could say, all union employees have to turn the wrench 20 times in a workday. And we, we view that as, as literal, you know, they need to turn it 20 times in a workday. But the union can come back and say, well, they only need to turn it 20 times if they're working on a job that would require a wrench. Well, that's not what the language says. So now you've got this argument about what that language actually means. and. And at that point, you could get an arbitrator involved. If you've got that kind of dispute, you would get an arbitrator involved who is, um, they're, they're the judge over the, the dispute and what, whatever they say, uh, yes, it means they have to turn it 20 times a day no matter what, or no, they only have to turn it 20 times if they're working on a project that requires a wrench. Whatever they interpret it as, that's the interpretation we'll follow until we have uh, the opportunity to negotiate it again and, and change that language. So with all that, all that being said, the, the Constitution is really, is really no different 
from from contract law. Uh, the Constitution is, in essence, a contract between the, the U.S. government and the people. Um, it it spells out, you know, the executive branch, what the executive branch's rights are. Uh, the legislative branch, what their rights are, what they can do, and the judicial branch is really a checks and balances between all of the branches. And then you have the Bill of Rights, which is what the what the government can or can't do with with the people. So, you know that that was the, the Constitution was drafted in, in the 1700s. So that was several years ago. A lot has changed since then. So you, you have you have two theories of thought on on this, and one one is you know original intent. We don't want to deviate from what the founding fathers originally intended for the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and then I'll go into that in a second. And then and the other theory is it's a it's a living document. It has to there's an evolving interpretation of this document. We can't stay. We can't be stagnant in our interpretation um, hundreds of years ago, or what the original intent was. There's no way they could have anticipated or intended. Or, there's no way they could have anticipated what the what the U.S. would be doing or where the U.S. would be 300 years from now. Uh, there's there's definitely pros and cons. There's validity to to both arguments. Um, with with an evolving interpretation, you're able to. Um, no, I'm sorry. Hey, Mr. Richard, or John. Yes. Are you guys, um, are you, are you want me to just focus on the Supreme Court? You know, no, how they... You're doing great. We can talk about how, uh, these, how the Constitution can be, uh, interpreted, or you can talk about the Supreme Court, either one, but you're hitting on the head about what we're talking about, for sure. So, John, okay. you're most comfortable with that one. Okay, sounds good. All right, so I kind of lost my train of thought with that question. So, with a living document, with it being an evolving interpretation, with with that with that camp, or even two camps, original list and living document. Um, in in the living document camp, with an evolving interpretation, that the, the pro is it allows you to anticipate and react to um, the different situations that the U.S. Is, is facing today that they weren't facing 300 years ago. Uh, the, the cons to that is you can quickly uh, start to deviate from what was originally intended, and, and the, the real debate there is where the values that they set forth 300 years ago are those the American values that we're going to hold to, or can can the American values change? And the the hesitancy there is you you want to stick firm to your your founding principles because if you start to you know wear away at those or um, chisel away at, at what the founding fathers intended, then you know, what what is what is the United States without its constitution and that original interpretation? Um, so that's, that kind of goes more into the originalist um, mind or, or, or thought where they want to transfer the meaning and intent of the founding fathers to current case law, to current issues that the U.S. is facing so that, that the U.S. Is, is firmly grounded in its original principles. So. Um, with that in mind, you know, we have we also have the Bill of Rights. And, you know, I'm sure Mr. Richard has talked to you all about when when you amend the Constitution, it takes two thirds of both houses for that to come in, or you can have a constitutional invention convention where half things like seventy five percent of the states have to vote in an amendment, um, if the house is at the federal level. So that that's kind of nice because it gives at the federal level, you can amend, but it also gives the states, they still hold the power to amend 